tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the F-100 Super Sabre. From its creation in 1949 to its final operational flight in 1979, the Super Sabre stretched the limits of military aviation. During its career, it broke the sound barrier, was baptized by fire as a devastating ground attack aircraft in both Korea and Vietnam, and flew with the Thunderbirds. Tonight, soar high with the F-100 Super Sabre on wing. Fighter squadrons flying faster than the speed of sound. Pilots engaged in combat miles above the earth. It was a truly fantastic concept. But when the first F-100 Super Sabres were delivered to the U.S. Air Force in 1953, that fantasy became reality. Until then, the only planes to have broken the sound barrier were experimental test aircraft. With the arrival of the F-100, the age of supersonic air combat had truly begun. Their arrival wasn't an uneventful one. The new plane set two records, the last subsonic world speed record and the first supersonic world speed record. After four years of development, the F-100 ushered in a new era. Ahead lay a long, tumultuous career that would be marked by distinction and marred by crashes and controversy. Overcoming the sound barrier was a landmark achievement, and the F-100 marked the dividing line between the first and second generation of jet fighters. Because the Air Force was just reaching the 100s to give as new plane designations, the first assortment of supersonic aircraft were known as the Century Fighters. The Century Fighters were renowned and included the F-105. But it was from the cockpits of F-100 Super Sabres that the Thunderbird pilots would eventually choose to perform their aerobatic magic. The plane had its problems, including landing characteristics that were more like a controlled crash. But in flight, its responsiveness and reliability won the affection of the most critical of pilots. The Super Sabre was the product of a very distinguished design team. The North American company had been quietly successful since its inception. There had been no upheaval in the company since 1935. And within this stable atmosphere, the designers were encouraged to probe the cutting edge of aviation development. The Super Sabre was born in 1949, when the designers began exerting efforts to take the next major step forward breaking the sound barrier. By the time the F-100 was developed, North American prided itself on having built the greatest fighters of World War II and Korea. Opinions may differ, but the two aircraft in question, the Mustang and the Sabre, would certainly be contenders for the title. As the third fighter from this stable, the F-100 faced the challenge of living up to this legacy. The company's first fighter was a classic. The P-51 Mustang was truly a legend. It had firmly established the company's name in the world of combat aircraft construction. In the European and Pacific theaters, the Mustang made its mark as a superb escort and attack aircraft. First flown in 1940, it stood at the end of a long line of propeller-driven fighters and was one of the greatest ever flown. 
I can't tell you the number of times people have asked what it's like to fly the P-51 Mustang. And for many years I tried to answer it using all the descriptive adjectives I could. Magnificent, it's, it's, a, it's a freedom, it's a unique experience, it's wonderful. And finally I discovered there really are no adjectives adequately available to describe what it's like. And my standard answer now is, if you don't feel it in here, then there's really no way one can describe what it's like to fly the airplane. Prior to the 51, when they had the 40s, 47s there and the P-38s, Jerry knew exactly how far they could escort the bombers into, into Europe. And when they broke off and had to come back, that's when Jerry just shot the heck out of them. Uh, so when we had the 51s there and we put on wing tanks, we could go any place that, they, that the bombers went with ease. The P-51 remained in service after World War II, overlapping into the developmental age of early jets. It was still in service in large numbers during the Korean conflict and was a mainstay in ground attack and troop support missions. North American built over 16,000 P-51s. This massive success with their first fighter project served the company well. It established them as a producer of first-class fighters, filled the company coffers, and set them up to make their next series of design studies. North American was ready to step into the jet age. It did so with two new planes, the FJ-1 for the Navy and the F-86 for the Air Force. By far the more successful of the two was the Air Force F-86, the Sabre. By this time, the company was so confident that the F-86 was delayed for over a year as company designers sorted out the problems of giving the plane swept wings and tail. North American stability and prosperity allowed for that kind of risk taking, and the resulting aircraft richly repaid the company's investment and patience. Sabres went into mass production in 1949, arriving just in time for their baptism by fire in Korea. The F-86 first went into service in Korea in December 1950. By that time, the Air Force had run into stiff opposition from MiG-15s, which were clearly outperforming other American jets. In mortal struggles over the Korean landscape, the newly arrived Sabre established combat superiority over the Russian plane. Better training and tactics, along with technology, were what really carried the day. Meanwhile, the Sabre's designers were tackling a new challenge, the sound barrier. Work commenced in 1949 and progressed rapidly through 1950. Early experiments in extending the capability of the Sabre merely revealed the limitations of its design. The engineers quickly returned to a blank sheet of paper and in the end developed a totally new and much larger aircraft. In January 1951, the Air Force gave the nod to this new design. Soon after, the F-100 supersonic day fighter was launched into production. No experimental or ex-aircraft were ever built. In fact, the first F-100 would be a production prototype or Y-plane. With typical North American confidence, this went from the drawing board to the construction bay three months prior to Air Force approval. In time, the F-100 found its niche as a fighter bomber. At the outset, it was designed as an air superiority fighter, but soon gained multi-role capability. The wing was redesigned to carry up to 6,000 pounds of stores on six pylons. This enabled the Super Sabre to carry a variety of weapons and ensured that the plane could pack a heavy punch. The Korean stalemate cemented American determination to be fully prepared for future conflicts, and the whole approach to weaponry was reapproached. Machine guns soon gave way to more powerful weapons, and the F-100 sting was made even more lethal with the installation of four 20-millimeter nose cannons.
Some theorists predicted that the unguided bomb would soon be replaced by missiles. The idea spread, and a number of F-100Ds were altered to accommodate the bullpup tactical air-to-surface missile. This weapon of the future was guided by the pilot with a cockpit toggle. Like early versions of many things, it wasn't terribly effective. Experience would show that the unguided bomb held a considerable cost advantage over complex missiles. The new weapons also proved to be too expensive for widespread use. Still, their relative accuracy was considered essential in some combat situations. Early F-100As had some major faults. In part, these were due to design changes ordered after the initial contract had been signed. During 1952, these changes included a critical shortening of the tail. This left the plane with very bad roll coupling problems. And after six major accidents, the F-100s were grounded. Two pilots died when, through no fault of their own, their planes went out of control and then broke up. In response to this tragedy, the tail was enlarged to its original shape and the wings extended. These changes were retrofitted to existing planes and incorporated into the new ones when production resumed. Apart from this very major flaw, the test series at Edwards Air Force Base went fairly smoothly. The only other concern focused on the plane's landing characteristics. This was eventually addressed through pilot training rather than modifications to the plane. Experiments in zero length launch were also conducted at Edwards. The F-100 had a range of well under 600 miles. It was later given in-flight refueling capability, either from a tanker or on the buddy system, from tanks on another plane. As a result, it became capable of extended patrols and long-range strikes. Two hundred three F-100As were built, the first 70 being delivered before the roll coupling problems were corrected. Fixing this delayed the program, and it wasn't until the spring of 1955 that production resumed. By that time, the upgraded F-100C was undergoing tests. The B designation had already been committed to a version intended to fly faster than twice the speed of sound. Design problems weren't limited to the potentially fatal control losses experienced at high speed. At low speeds, the plane could also be very unforgiving. Here, a pilot realized that he undershot his landing point and frantically attempted to pull his plane up. In opening his throttle too fast, he induced a compressor stall, and then, in a series of overcorrections, fatally compounded his problem. This incident was not unique, and the term saber dance gained a new and darker meaning. The F-100 was a uh, was a fairly non-forgiving airplane uh, to fly uh, when compared with the airplanes that we had trained in and compared with the airplanes that now uh, we have in the inventory. The F-100 had some very unusual characteristics. It, uh, for its weight, it was fairly underpowered. Uh, the average young fighter pilot would find himself on final approach many times um, with a death grip on the stick pulling up as hard as he could to try to just barely make the runway. Uh, you had to anticipate a go-around in the traffic pattern fairly early. Um, you had to be thinking ahead of the... I think we all have had very, very uh, hair-raising experiences. The F-100, again, was air-to-air uh, -air and air-to-ground, and we trained in both of those modes. And I think it's fair uh, to say that there were an awful lot of opportunities that you uh, brought the airplane back and walked away from a flight that you weren't very proud of. Uh, most of those experiences had to do with adverse yaw and uh, the compressor-style characteristics that the airplane had. The F-100 design was not necessarily flawed. 
The problem stemmed from the plane's purpose, which was to go fast, and many of the characteristics essential in going fast inhibit low-speed control. The F-100 stalled at around 150 knots. It was sluggish and unresponsive anywhere near that low a speed. The pilot's forward view was seriously obstructed. The throttle of a slowed-down saber jet was touching, and landings were never simple. In the end, the F-100's low speed control problems were never fully corrected. It was just another deadly possibility that the pilots had to learn to live with. Training, experience, and the instinct for self-preservation kept the accident rate down. And most flyers found it safer to strain the undercarriage in higher speed landings than to meddle with the F-100 at slow speeds. The Super Sabre embodied the demands of supersonic flight. From the sharp lips of its air intake to the sweep of its wings, even stationary, F-100s gave an impression of speed. There were many innovative touches about them. Fully pivoting slab horizontal tail surfaces were positioned as low as possible on the flattened belly of the fuselage. There were no outboard flaps. Instead, a system of leading edge slats were employed. Throughout its career, the F-100 had the type of problems to be expected of such an advanced design. In some ways, it was an adventurous experiment. North Americans selflessly circulated information about these problems throughout the American aerospace industry. Though it was information obtained through costly research and analysis, the company passed it on nevertheless. Because of this, the industry as a whole advanced and mistakes were seldom repeated. North American and most Super Sabre pilots were well pleased with the plane. This included the famed Thunderbirds aerobatic team. In fact, they flew the F-100 longer than any other aircraft. This loyalty went very deep. Once they were issued replacement F-105s, and finding these not up to par, promptly returned to their Super Sabres. Thunderbirds flew the F-100 from 1956 until 1969. They started with the first six examples of the C model and stayed with the F-100 from then on. Needless to say, they came to know every virtue and every vice the aircraft had. Okay, Thunderbirds, let's do a loop. The Thunderbirds also wrote another sad chapter of the F-100 story. After a crash during one of their air shows, investigations turned up fatigue problems in the wings of the plane. It is suspected that some of the Super Sabres that went down in Vietnam may have been lost due to the same flaw. This diagnosis led to immediate remedial action, saving other pilots from a similar fate. The Thunderbird's performances with the Super Sabre are proof that even if practice cannot make perfect, it can come very, very close. These thrilling planes were not specially built supermodels. They were stock aircraft, maintained and flown for a specific purpose. The Thunderbirds exaggerate and embellish normal maneuvers in a choreographed sequence that appears to push the aircraft into unusual or extreme conditions. But each pilot is a pro, and the test is to match his ability with that of the plane. Because of the high accident rate with the F-100, a two-seat version, the F-100F, was developed to familiarize pilots with the plane. This effectively transferred the bulk of the accident rate onto the trainers. The F model suffered heavily, 
over a quarter of them are lost in non-combat mishaps. Each airplane imposes its own demands upon a pilot, and the F-100 was the first of a new breed. Because of this, all personnel transferred to it were given extra intensive training. With the revolutionary advance to supersonic flight, pilots needed to start training all over again. Because jets not only greatly increased speeds, but they drastically reduced the pilot's room for error. In combat against Japanese Zeros and North Korean and Chinese MiG-15s, the American military learned that advanced pilot training and tactical discipline can overcome technical disadvantages. The Zeros and MiGs were superior aircraft to many of those pitted against them, but they were frequently outperformed because of their pilot's limited skills. But when an advanced pilot is put into a superior plane, the road to survival and victory is a more certain one. This is what the United States did with the Century Fighters and their crews. Korea had taught many lessons about aerial warfare. It was learned that strategic campaigns aimed at destroying an opponent's means of production were sometimes of dubious value especially if your opponent didn't have the means of making war, but rather relied on outside suppliers. It became evident that there was a vast gulf between world war and limited war. In a limited struggle, aerial warfare really became a matter of maintaining air superiority, interdicting the enemy's supplies, and supporting ground troops through battlefront strikes. The F-100 became more and more a tactical fighter bomber. There were faster interceptors, and more expensive Mach 2 long-range strike aircraft, but the Super Sabre became the primary battlefield support weapon. Only 203 of the Interceptor A models were built. The following C model was a fighter bomber, and 476 of these appeared. The fully dedicated attack version, the F-100D, was built in far greater numbers. 1,274 were produced. The C and D models were out-and-out -out attack aircraft. The combination of high landing speed and considerable bulk made the F-100 difficult to stop on landing. If the landing chute blew out, the pilot was set for a very long roll. Most of the planes of the era suffered the same problem and relied on long concrete runways. It was just another thing that the fighter pilots of the time had to accept as part of the job. The company had given the Super Sabre its name, but for many, it was just too much of a mouthful. The planes came to be known by their crews as Huns, a contraction of F-100. Including two-seat trainers and the two prototypes, 2,294 were built. The last of these was delivered in October 1959. From 1957, they equipped 16 U.S. Air Force fighter wings and were a vital weapon in the American arsenal. The F-100B project was meant to take advantage of the Hun's reconfiguration into a tactical strike aircraft. The limited speed of the F-100 design, around Mach 1.25, prompted a redevelopment effort to make a plane that could approach Mach 2. Features were added to gear the aircraft for tactical fighter-bomber missions. These features soon came to dominate the design and included a recess in the hull providing semi-submerged nuclear weapon stowage. This innovation was actually rediscovered 30 years later and given the name conformal storage. To safely eject the bombs from this recess, the air intake for the engine was shifted to the top of the fuselage. As it had with the Hun, tactical consideration came to totally dominate the F-100B.
Air Force approval to proceed with the design was given on June 11, 1954. This was followed a month later by the issue of a new designation for the aircraft. The F-100B became the F-107. By that time, the changes had become so radical that the F-107A really had little left in common with the Hunt. The fuselage, in addition to its shark fin intake, was 50% longer than the 100. Like the Super Sabre, the F-107 featured many innovations, including an all-movable vertical tail surface and variable air intake ducts. The plane also had a multitude of built-in equipment including chaff dispensers, radar beacons, maneuverable autopilot, and computerized stability augmentation. With this avionics package, the F-107A was really a leap into the future of electronic development. The first F-107A took to flight on September 10, 1956 at Edwards Air Force Base. The test series went ahead, and though there were some minor problems evident, North American was increasingly confident that it would be a hot seller. The 107 was in competition with the Republic F-105, which appeared to be encountering developmental problems and wasn't ready to fly. The fly-offs were postponed. North American referred to the F-107 as the Super Super Sabre, their biggest worry was that once the 107 won the contract, construction would go to Republic, whose factory had no work of its own. Overly confident North American designers even turned their minds to the next apparent project, a Mach 3 fighter. Despite North American's confidence, the decision, when announced, came down on the side of Republic's F-105. Now it was obvious that the F-107 would never be built in numbers. An initial 33 examples had been contracted, but only the three test aircraft were fully built. It said that the 105 won because of its internal bomb bay, although this feature was never really used. The F-107 was left with the bitter consolation of being one of the best planes not to win an Air Force contract. But the F-107's failure didn't negate the f 100s success, and the Super Sabre soon took its place in the front line of the U.S. Air Force. The late 50s and early 60s was a time of peace, and North American took the chance to refine the plane. The F-100D model, which introduced integrated refueling gear, carried an astounding array of non-nuclear stores. Over 75 weapons, bomb racks, ECM pods, launchers for rockets, mines, flares, and sundry other attachments were compatible with the plane. The D had a number of significant adjustments, including landing flaps, greater wing area, and a taller tail. Over the years, the C and D models appeared in a number of mini variations, some with different cockpit layouts. 148 D models were even equipped with zero length launch. In 1962, an expensive program was begun to standardize existing Huns. The program took until 1965 to complete, with an average 60 days spent to modify each plane. But after the refit, Tactical Air Command finally had what it wanted, a fleet of advanced, combat-ready F-100s. The F-100 went to war on the 9th of June, 1964. Sent to strike a target in the tiny nation of Laos, eight pilots flying F-100Ds attacked a path at Laos stronghold in a reprisal raid. This was in retaliation for the shooting down of a Navy reconnaissance plane. It would be only the first of hundreds of missions flown over Southeast Asia, where time and again the plane would prove its worth in battle. From the first raid onward, the Huns' involvement gradually escalated. In March 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder began. The United States had become fully entangled in the conflict, and as the leading tactical fighter on the spot, so did the F-100.
Vietnam lacked landing fields for jet-powered aircraft, and the U.S. rapidly began building new installations. These included new bases at Bien Hoa, Phan Rang, Phu Cát, and Thuy Hoa. All would see immense super saber activity in the years to come. At many locations in Vietnam, pairs of 10,000 foot runways were built, together with accommodation, administration, and maintenance facilities. In terms of modern airfields, South Vietnam became one of the most richly endowed nations on earth. We had a wonderful maintenance uh, outfit uh, at Benoit, and uh, they were very good at flattening small pieces of aluminum and patching the airplanes. Uh, in some cases, we even used beer cans for short-term uh, uh, maintenance on the airplanes, but uh, um, most of the ground fire we uh, sustained was uh, small. Now we return to Wings on the Discovery Channel. At the peak of their deployment, 490 F-100s were operating from South Vietnamese bases. Other units were stationed in Thailand. Aircraft and units were rotated so that most of the Air Force's Super Sabres saw action at one time or another. Even the two-seat trainers arrived on the scene to be re-equipped as the first wild weasel aircraft. They would soon be wrecking devastation on enemy anti-aircraft installations. In 1966, the base at Phan Rang was one of the first to receive an all F-100 fighter wing. It remained a center of Super Sabre activity throughout the war. At one time, 140 operated from the field. By the middle of 1967, four fighter wings, the 3rd, 31st, 35th, and 37th, were operating the Hun in Vietnam. Although histories of the Vietnam Air War might make only passing reference to the F-100s, it's not because they weren't there in numbers. Perhaps not as glamorous as other planes, their contribution to the war effort was irreplaceable. In long-range strikes against North Vietnam, the Super Sabre's weaknesses became evident when compared to the newer F-105 and F-4. In such company, the F-100 was definitely outclassed. However, the F-100 served admirably as the aerial artillery so desperately needed by U.S. ground troops. At times, this was the most important task performed by the Air Force, especially to the grunts toughing it out below. F-100s, operating with forward air controllers, or FACs, would drop their loads with devastating effect. Their missions can be described simply. Briefing takeoff, refueling, flying to a set of coordinates, rendezvousing with the FAC, locating and attacking targets, finally heading back to base for more ordnance. A clinical description for what was a devastating endeavor. The pattern of the missions was repetitive, and those missions were flown in vast numbers. As early as 1969, the four wings stationed in South Vietnam had flown more combat missions than the combined total of all the thousands of P-51 Mustangs engaged in World War II. The intensity never let up airfields in South Vietnam became the busiest in the world. In January 1967, figures for the base at Bien Hoa showed 65,000 takeoffs and landings. This translates into one every 42 seconds for 31 days straight. Many of those were in F-100s. In light of this, the word busy takes on a new and fuller meaning. As soon as a plane arrived back at base, a de-arming crew cleared the guns and reset the safety pins. Only then could the flurry of maintenance, fueling, and rearming begin. With the crew chiefs checking and rechecking the plane during the process, they were quickly readied for the next action. In practice, the Huns would fly two missions a day. Operational readiness figures achieved by F-100s in Vietnam sometimes registered above 95% which was a credit to the planes and their crews. Wow. 
With its seemingly endless rounds of raids and replenishment, the activity at Twiwa wasn't much different from the other F-100 bases of the war. The 31st brought with it about 110 aircraft. 44 National Guard planes were later added, making a total of over 150 Huns. Day and night, the routines at the base went on, with the men working a minimum of six days a week to keep up with the deadly rotation of strikes. By the time a plane was ready for its mission, it would be loaded with fuel, ammunition and stores to the point where a pilot needed every inch of airstrip just to take off. Tui Wa's runway faced out to sea, and with mountains at the other end of the strip, most landings and takeoffs went over the beach. The view may have been nice, but variable sea breezes averaging around 25 knots and blowing across the runways tended to complicate matters. F-100 missions fell into two basic categories, planned strikes preceded by extensive briefings, and combat emergencies, responses to urgent calls for help from forward air controllers or army units. F-100s also joined in pilot rescue operations, sometimes providing a wall of suppressive fire against encircling enemy troops. Um, our primary concern was to do the job without uh, endangering the uh, individuals on the ground. We were called into some very, very close, uh, close air support missions. I can remember some evenings uh, under flares where you could actually see the enemy crawling over the top of some of the walls and the night defensive positions underneath the flares. And in some cases, we were even uh, called on by the ground troops to drop right into the encampments and right onto the walls uh, where the Viet Cong uh, attackers were, were uh, positioning themselves. And I mean, in some cases, you were dropping within 50 or 100 feet of uh, U.S. force. Now we return to Wings on the Discovery Channel. Planes would often be in the air and over a target within minutes. Sometimes the men on the ground would call down strikes only 50 yards from their own positions. This is a tribute to the planes and their pilots, because the grunts on the ground would have been far more wary of calling for help if the Super Sabres hadn't established a solid reputation for getting there fast and hitting only what they shot at. The need for extreme accuracy in supporting ground troops was an additional and not inconsiderable burden on already tense pilots. Vietnam was a major testing ground for U.S. military hardware. Most of the work of the Huns was done with basic ordnance, like tumbling, unfinned napalm canisters. and 500 and 750 pound iron bombs of World War II design. In addition, there were the four cannon, which gave the Super Saber its lethal strafing power. By 1970, replacement of the F-100s with F-4s and F-111s was proceeding rapidly. Many of the airframes had passed 5,000 hours, and the F-100's age was telling. It had been an old design when it entered combat. Outclassed by opposing MiGs, it was simply no longer in the race as an air superiority weapon. However, it made quite a name for itself in its support of the Army, and was also the first wild weasel aircraft. As the war drew to a close, the F-100s left Vietnam unit by unit. The last of the 35th Tactical Wing at Phan Rang disappeared in July 1971. Huns flew 360,283 sorties in Vietnam, more operational sorties than any other type in that war. 243 of the planes were lost, 198 of those in combat.
The majority of the F-100s used in foreign air forces were second-hand. In 1958, the French were the first foreign country to receive new Super Sabres. They operated 100 of them, with 15 of the F models and 85 Ds. These remained in French service until 1980. Denmark also had three squadrons of Huns and operated them until 1982. And Taiwan received and operated second-hand A models, which were later upgraded. But by far the largest customer for second-hand Super Sabres was Turkey. Out of the over 300 eventually purchased, the Turks reportedly still have some F-100s in storage. But generally, the Super Sabre wasn't a great foreign sales success for North American. And with the failure of the F-107, they were left without any fighter contracts whatsoever. But North American didn't give up on the fighter building business. On the contrary, they were already working on the Mach 3 F-108 Rapier, which, like the XP-70 Valkyrie, was to be another step into the future. In June 1957, the company was given a contract to develop a proposal that had been initiated in 1955. The plane envisaged would be an interceptor capable of operating at Mach 3 at 70,000 feet. It would have been able to fly 1,000 miles from its base, launch a missile, and be back home and on the ground in half an hour. The aim was to destroy incoming missiles or bombers far out to sea. Unfortunately, the plane would have carried an enormous price tag. And after viewing the mock-up in January 1959, the Air Force backed off. On September 23, 1959, North American was advised of the Rapier program's cancellation. After only three generations, all of which had been illustrious ones, the company's days of fighter construction were at an end. After Vietnam, Huns remained in service solely with the National Guard, and by 1972, had been completely phased out of Air Force use. They would stay on with the National Guard for a few more years, but almost no low-time planes were left. Having become a relic, they were gradually phased out. They had been with the Guard for over 21 years, and several pilots had logged over 5,000 flying hours in them. The last operational National Guard flight was on the 10th of November, 1979. The only flights after that were ferrying operations. The F-100 is now a thing of the past. It was the product of an experimental age and bridged two separate eras. Between 1949 and 1979, a lot had happened in aviation. In speed, the plane had gone from the world record holder to a non-contender, even before its production cycle was over. And although it had no fancy avionics, pilots grew to love it, both for the plane it was and for the hard lessons it taught them. Among old Hun jockeys, there is little dissent about its worth. At one time, the subject of considerable doubt the Super Sabre ended its career with a proud reputation. And with the distinction of its performance in Vietnam, that reputation is sure to live on for a very long time.